Prasad, and we're lucky to be here today, and also lucky to be with Pamela Farrow, who's going to share a lot of her knowledge. She works in a clinic in Mattapoisett, Massachusetts, and has experience treating hundreds of mostly autism patients, a lot of moms. And we're going to talk about how what you can learn from autism, because autism is, not, I'm not trying to start the talk, but I guess I have. <laughs> but, but autism is, is often, um, it, it's not only autism, it's aut autism and, meaning autism and IBS, or autism and OCD, or autism and reflux. And there are a lot of behavioral and, and actually what look like autoimmune issues in the children. So I guess I, I, I want to get a quick show of hands if anyone had heard about the specific carbohydrate diet before. Or anyone who had done any, um, has any, tried any kind of dietary interventions, whether a gluten-free diet or just curious in general? Okay. Because I think a lot of this talk, it, it, will, it will kind of build on, on talking about autoimmune disease and one window in which you can treat it. So now, now I will formally start. <laughs> oh. I, I want to start by thanking the Marion Institute, especially Abby and Brooke, for inviting us here today. And as I mentioned, the, the main thrust of our talk is to show how diet can be a window or opportunity for healing and managing what are usually seen as, as medical issues. So in, in terms of my, my personal history, my main qualifi qualification is as a curious patient. So to give some background, when I was 23, I'm, I'm about 20 years past that now, I was in my, my sixth year of struggling with ulcerative colitis. At best, eating led to bloating and low levels of pain. This was punctuated by periods of, of bloody diarrhea, sharp headaches, and, and stomach cramping, which was only alleviated by high doses of prednisone. I don't know if people here are familiar with uh, the steroid medication a little bit. Um, so at the time, I, I was relegated to living at home, and I barely had enough energy to get through each workday. And one of my memories was after a third hospitalization, with eyes popping from steroids and unable to sleep, I was wandering in my dad's, um, kind of his workshop, He's, which is very messy. And I was looking for, for an awl, which it's like a screwdriver, but has a, a, a pointy end on it. It's for making holes. And I actually, I, I raised it up and, and kind of and plunged it down. And I wasn't trying to hurt myself. I was actually trying to make additional holes in my belt because I, because I had lost so much weight from the hospital and I knew that um, I had to get to work the next day and I need my pants to stay on. <laughs> <laughs> so so in, in case you were wondering my, uh, in, you know, how I fit in in terms of autoimmune disease in women, I do have the bone profile of a Caucasian woman in terms of, in terms of osteoporosis and, and, and steroids. And this is a picture of my, my college campus. And uh, I, when I was sick, I was, you know, it was from high school till after college. And the X's are where I was looking for bathrooms all the time with, with ulcerative colitis, which was unpleasant. And that time, by, by kind of luck and chance, I ran into the, this uh, specific carbohydrate diet. It's similar to, I don't know if anyone's heard of like GAPS, or it's, it's almost similar to paleo now. Um, but that ended up being a lifesaver for me. I was able to you know, gain weight back, work through the day, actually go to school at night. And this is a picture about a year and a half later where you know, I was working in New York for about four years, and there's no, there's no X's on, on Manhattan. So. <laughs> that was. Um, so we mentioned not that many people have heard of the SCD. Has anyone heard of GAPS, if you want to raise your hand a little? A few people there. So I want to give a, a quick history because this, this diet is actually older than, you know, it's older than GMO foods, it's older than the heavy use of pesticides, it's older than almost my grandmother, I think she's the only thing I know that's older. So back in, if you lived in New York City in the 19, around the 1920s, if you had celiac disease, there's a 25% chance that you would, you would actually die. And celiac disease at the time wasn't associated with gluten at all. It, you know, the, the picture was people who basically weren't able to digest anything, especially children. They would have, you know, stick figure arms and legs, bloated bellies, 
and pretty much waste away. And around that time, there was a doctor, Sidney Haas, who was a pediatrician, and he, and through kind of you know trial and error and observation, he found that children were able to take in, you know, like uh, some some forms of protein, some fruits and vegetables, and, but no carbohydrates in, in terms of like the rice, pasta, etc. But they were also able to tolerate uh, bananas, which had ripened and had speckles on the skin, and it ended up being a lifesaver. This was actually the diet. It was kind of nicknamed the banana diet, but it was, was formally called the specific carbohydrate diet. And this was the diet for celiac disease up until about World War II. Actually, during World War II, when, when ships were being requisitioned for the war instead of, you know, there, there, there were ships coming from like South America with bananas. There was a banana shortage in New York City which led to the New York Times printing a letter from Dr. Haas telling people that, you know, don't, you know, don't give up hope. You can go to a certain pier and, and, and still get food. And he said if, there, if there's actually a, a serious shortage, the government would requisition airplanes and fly bananas in. And that actually did happen back then. You know, the, the SCD kind of, it, it sort of faded out of use for, for years because it was found that avoiding bread for celiac disease. Is anyone um, coming here for celiac disease at all, actually, or, or any familiarity with that? But, but it basically, avoiding bread was sort of a, a simpler thing than doing the specific carbohydrate diet for celiac disease. And, it, and it, it fell out of fashion. Although Dr. Haas was sort of fighting against it because he found that you know, 18 months to two, to two years on the diet patients could go back to a, a full diet. They weren't stuck on a, a restrictive diet. Where people with celiac disease now, even today, like 80% of them, they, they don't have uh, intestinal healing shown by studies by, by the Mayo Clinic and others. I mean, so the, the, story, the story of the SCD kind of continues where in the, in the 60s or, or late 50s, Elaine Gottschall was a mom living in Manhattan with a daughter with ulcerative colitis who was scheduled for surgery. She was an eight-year-old. And she, ha she happened to hear about Dr. Haas through a friend. And she, she was put on the diet. Her daughter was put on the diet for ulcerative colitis. And it, it led to the, the, you know, the abatement of the symptoms. And she was able to go back to a regular diet and avoid surgery. So Elaine was, over the years, she was irritated hearing about you know, base, mainly digestive issues, Crohn's disease, and ulcerative colitis. And she would tell friends, hey, you should, hear, you, you should you know, take a look at this diet. But by then, Sydney Haas had passed away. And she decided around the age of 40 to go back to school and do a master's degree in, in biochemistry. And basically, she kind of reverse engineered Sydney Haas's original diet. And we'll see later on that some of the work she did then is in the medical journals now. And what happened, she put out a book in 1992 which carried the diet, I'd say through a few decades. It led to a lot of cookbooks, including you know, one, one I did with someone. And most of these people had met Elaine Gottschall. They were, on the, were, they were in the market. And now more recently, there's a lot of studies going on. I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna walk you through all these studies, but I wanna say that Seattle Children's Hospital, if a child has celiac disease or Crohn's disease or an ulcerative colitis, this diet is now the, the first line treatment at Seattle Children's. There's studies going on at Stanford. There's, there's uh, at UMass um, down in Worcester, there's a derivative of this diet also being used for similar problems. And actually it's located in the cardiovascular center. And all these, what, what's, what's being shown now is this diet has the ability to change the intestinal flora and basically let the immune system heal. So now I'm going to start getting into some of the science of the diet. And to start out, I want to talk about, I want to present that one, of, one of Pam's patients who had severe reflux. I'm going to, I'm going to read a little about this. Her name was Ava. And, and this is, and this, what I'm about to read is taken from uh, notes that from talking to her mom. Can you hear me in the back okay? Okay. Okay, so all through infancy, 
Ava cried when it came time to eat. Her mother, Karen, kept her upright after meals, fed her smaller portions, and changed feeding times. But no matter what she did, Ava pushed the bottle away, twisting her body and arching her back. When, finally, when she finally drank, she would gag and, and often vomit. The doctor diagnosed Ava with, with GER and tried several brands of, uh, of common drugs used, proton pump inhibitors. She continued to vomit until 19 months of age. In photographs, she pairs pale with dark spots beneath her eyes. And, and you can see in, the, in this photo, she, she doesn't look that, that well. When she was almost three years old, a major hospital referred her to a feeding specialist. So she was put on an appetite stimulant, and, she was also, and also behavioral therapy was given, meaning she would be allowed to play with a toy if she took a bite of food. And that seemed to work for a little bit, but as her mom said, it didn't last long, and a downward spiral began. When Ava reached four, she was still nonverbal, and she limited her daily diet to the, what you see here. So basically crackers, french fries, salami, toast with cream cheese, and uh, a brand name nutrition shake, which, which, I won't, which I won't mention, but it was loaded with, with sugar and carbohydrates. And now I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave Ava and, and, and go into the diet. We're gonna come back to Ava at the end to talk about what happened when she was able to, to um, have dietary interventions introduced. So this slide, it's, a, it's an old, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm doing some of this from an autism perspective, but it's very applicable to autoimmune disease. And as Pam will talk about in clinical practice, to, to women as well, a lot of moms have similar symptoms to children in terms of GI issues. So in, in autoimmune disease and, and autism especially, you know, it's seen as either genetic or was mostly seen as either genetic or maybe you had some kind of personality disorder. And the genetic idea meant that the disease is, is static. You have rheumatoid arthritis, you have IBS. You know, there's, it's either something in your head or sorry, you just have this and it's unchangeable, untreatable. Now that, you know, the bigger picture, you know, for autoimmune disease is there's a, there's a big environmental component. And that environmental component, by environment, it's, you know, it's chemicals in the air, it's, it's food we eat, it's, it's um, the hundred chemicals you're exposed to on average every morning just through health and beauty products. That's like the, the U.S. average. But environment kind of gives us a way to, to toggle things a little bit. And again, the focus of this talk is about, is about working on diet and how that can change the environment and basically influence symptoms. And I do want to give a caveat that, you know, we, we are, in terms of the lens of diet, which I'll continue to talk about, it's not an underlying cause, but, it, but it, again, it's a, way, it's a way to manage things. And from all the, the reading we've done, and unfortunately I missed the end of Dr. McGonigal's talk, but there is a huge influence of, of pervasive chemicals in the environment. The Lancet Neurology Journal came out with another study last year saying these are another six chemicals we've identified that harm the developing brain. And, and they said they are responsible for the rise in autism and ADHD. And usually in, in, in these journals, it say, it, it, they say we need more study or there's so many factors involved, we don't really know what's going on. But, but in this case, they just said, this is it. We know, we know what's going on here. So in terms of going back to, to the influence of what we eat, there's this famous quote that Elaine, well, famous maybe to me, but a quote that Elaine Gottschall was often said that what we, ha what we eat beyond what we have the power to digest causes harm. And I want to explain that idea through three metaphors. Uh, the bubbling cauldron, attack on the castle walls, and the movie theater. I've, I've experienced being a movie usher, so I'm drawing upon that expertise. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what we've seen, in, and this is coming out now in terms of you know, that treatment of, of, again, Crohn's, colitis, IBS, et cetera, is the body seems to not have the ability to fully break down the food it's eating. So normally when we, when we eat uh, starches, they start out as long chains of sugars. They're broken down into double sugars. 
and in the small intestine, they're, they're simply absorbed. Does anyone have a, not have a picture of the small intestine in their heads? Does that, it's kind of like the, the sausage in the middle of the abdomen. So, it, so the, the sugars are absorbed and, and everyone's happy. However, when, in the, when the case is when, when um, it's not absorbed, and here you could think of you know, fermenting beer or something, these sugars end up feeding harmful bacteria in the intestine. And you hear a lot of new, news now about the microbiome and intestinal bacteria, and there's so much going on there. And, and in a, in a sort of simplistic way, we could say that basically harmful bacteria is, is growing in your gut. And what this harmful bacteria does, it produces two things. One, it, one is gas. So you know, if you have, if you, if you have um, intestinal disease, you might have like uh, pants with an elastic waistband to, to handle a few in, extra inches after a meal. And, and it also produces acids, which harm the intestinal lining. And the, the gas and the, and the acids, they can cause bloating and pain. And what that does in, in a child with autism who's not able to express this pain verbally, it can, it can lead to agitation, crying, pressing their abdomen, gritting their teeth. In terms of an adult, which is more applicable here, it can lead to anxiety, <laughs> pain, gritting, po you know, possibly gritting your teeth. And, and, and just this feeling of discomfort and also anxiety, you, know, you, you see it a lot with um, Drivers on the Mass Pike, I'm guessing, <laughs> might, have, might have some of this. And in every study they've done so far in children with autism, as well as people with Crohn's, ulcerative colitis, some, and some of these other diseases, also they're, they're starting to look at depression and, and, and other disorders. They are finding abnormal intestinal bacteria. And the way they do that, they, they either like use stool samples or they can take direct samples from your intestine and, and do DNA analysis. This is a list of, of symptoms that are seen if someone has autism and they have abdominal pain. So they range all the way from what we talked about to um, self-harm, self like even, even head banging, moaning, et cetera. And, and this list actually comes from a report done by 27 in, in medical institutions, including, including Harvard, MGH, et cetera. The other thing, the, the, you know, this, this bubbling cauldron or, or intestinal fermentation can do is it can lower the levels of magnesium, B vitamins, zinc, and, and, other, and other micronutrients. There was a study done in 1993 with 50 normal people. I mean, well, normal meaning they, they didn't have, um, a, strictly speaking, an immune disorder. They definitely had, a, they had anxiety, a lot of them. They had thick medical files where they, they weren't sure what exactly was wrong with them. Uh, some, some bits of chronic fatigue. And they found in that study that the, just having this intestinal fermentation going on, it lowered the, their ability to absorb vitamins to the point where it changed mood and impacts circulatory functioning. And I think what's important about, about this idea is this was the first time that I found, unless you go back to the 20s, but in the 90s, where it said that looking, looking at the intestine and this fermentation going on, the symptoms people were having were usually seen as psychological, and they, and they were finding like a biological basis for these symptoms. So, so again, the bubbling cauldron, abdominal pain and discomfort, and it could lower vitamin and mineral levels. The second thing is, what happens when this, when this bu bubbling cauldron continues, or you, or you continue to have this intestinal fermentation? The, the, I think, you know, you think of the gut, or the, or the cell lining of the gut, you can think of it as a, as a castle wall. It's, it's very well guarded. Things are not going to, you know, go from the outside to the inside unless, unless they're recognized by the body, they're allowed to enter. Except when you, when you have this intestinal fermentation going on, you could think of it as, this is another kind of homemade analogy, 
But imagine it, like the, you're in charge of, of cleaning the kitchen floor and someone throws an egg on the kitchen floor every 30 seconds and you have a sponge and you're just trying to keep up constantly with this, with this outside pressure. So after a while, the intestinal wall starts looking like this. It's, it's basically like, you know, you can't, you can't see the slide that well, I think, right now, but it's a, it's a castle under attack. People are climbing over, they're, they're blowing holes in the castle wall. And when that happens, there's, there's two big effects. There's more, you know, the, the body is less able to um, absorb essential nutrients. And also you have unwanted bacteria and protein going into the bloodstream. And what this does, it, it weakens the immune system. So this is a more, a more modern you know, study from a couple years ago. And this journal was, was saying for IBS, we're seeing abnormal bacteria here. It's causing gas. And it's letting um, harmful bacteria get into, the, get into the body and cross through the cell, the cell wall. So it kind of went from you know, hypotheses in the, in the 80s and even in the 50s to people seeing this in patients. You know, going back to autism again, you know, one of the symptoms of a weakened immune system is impaired behavior. And there, there's hundreds of studies showing that the children with autism have immune dysregulation, which seems to be, which seems to be part of this, this leaky gut or, or holes in, in the cell wall. Another impact of bacteria crossing through the cell wall and getting into the body is is it, cause it can cause inflammation in other parts of the body. I'm using this example where you know, children with autism, actually people with chronic fatigue too, they have, they have a continuous inflammation of the brain. And for, for children with autism, the, you know, this is uh, agreed by all the neurologists that this inflammation process is going on. But the question is, is what's driving it? And one idea I'm gonna, I'm gonna give out is that because bacteria is getting through the cell wall and bacteria is getting through other parts of the body, that that is causing inflammation eventually in the brain. And in practice, which Pam will talk about more, um, there was one patient. So, so for, for autism, everyone has motor skill issues across the board, whether it's riding a bike or throwing a ball or trying to, to I, I think like the hardest thing is fine motor skills. Uh, such as handwriting. And one boy she had, he would, you know, literally be crying in class because although he knew what he was trying what he was supposed to do to write letters, he physically was just unable to coordinate his hands to do it. And after about nine months or so of dietary intervention, his mom brought in this paper where the teacher said he was finally he was actually handwriting without tears. So it seems that addressing some of the, these leaky gut issues for some people can, can also affect you know, motor, motor control issues. And it's been noticed that there's uh, a similar patterns of motor control issues in, in actually Parkinson's disease in autism. So this might be one of the mechanisms by, by, by that's happening. Another thing about leaky gut is that a lot of people seem like they can't tolerate any foods. I don't know if anyone here has, has done like allergy tests and, and you know, if you're, if you're feeling pretty sick, you can seem like you're allergic to everything. You know, gluten, casein, different, different nuts, etc. And there's a difference in, in terms of what allergies are. There's an idea of acute allergies, like, a, like bee stings or peanut butter, where you're going to have an immediate, you know, possibly anaphylactic reaction. But some of these other allergies, the food allergies, so say, say you cut something out of your diet that you seem to be allergic to, it doesn't it doesn't seem may not seem to go away right away, and that also may be due to a leaky gut because now food you know proteins like gluten and casein they're supposed to be broken down before they get into the body, they can just kind of cross over through that broken wall, and the body creates antibodies toward them, or you know mounts mounts that immune defense uh, that immune response, so in some sense when when you're in this state of of having you know the, the broken castle walls, you could seem allergic to everything. You could seem 
that you can't digest anything or just irritated all the time. So the last, the last metaphor I wanted to talk about was, was the movie theater or oxidative stress. Does anyone, does, does anyone know what oxidative stress is? It can help us out, maybe. So uh, this is, this is again, a, a, another, another fairly simplified view. There, there's, there's actually there's this idea of like free radicals and antioxidants, which this is, this is kind of a simplistic way because free radicals aren't always, aren't always bad. But backing up for a moment, you could think at, at the cellular level that um, this, when, when, a cell is, when a cell is going through its normal process of creating energy, it's almost like a show going on. I think of like a show in a movie theater, and when the cell is done with that process, it's like the movie theater. There might be some garbage on the ground, like a few popcorn containers or, or a soda, and the ushers will come in, pick it up, and they'll be ready for the next show. So during the regular cellular process, sort of, you know, there's some, there's some, I guess, garbage created, but it's also picked up. Now with oxidative stress, I think of like a movie, a, a show at a movie theater where 300 people go into the show, they all have a lot, large popcorns and soda, and they, they throw them on the ground. And so the, the ushers can't clean up in between the show, and the next patrons come in, and, and they're slipping and sliding on this stuff, and they also throw it on the floor. And then you have another show, and you can see over time that basically the, the cellular processes kind of go haywire, and this is seen as, as high levels of, of oxidative stress which are seen in you know, most, most autoimmune diseases. They're, really, they're even seen in behaviors such as OCD. And, in, in ter and so you have the, these free radicals or the garbage in the movie theater kind of outstripping the, the process of the cell to repair itself or to clean things up. And, and you, know, you hear about like you need more antioxidants in your diet or you need more vitamins, but that won't really tilt the balance because you still have these people constantly creating creating garbage. So one, one way to, to reduce that, that load of free radicals, which we'll talk about more, is, is through diet. So the question is, what do you do? You know, we, we, have, we have all these effects going on. And really, we go back to the idea of trying to only eat things which can be digested. So you might start out with a fairly limited diet. But what happens if you, if you start limiting your diet and stop feeding the harmful bacteria, then the cell walls will have a, the body will have a chance to repair itself. So the cell walls will eventually go back to a state where they are able to keep you know, harmful proteins and bacteria out of the body. And then the cells will also be given a chance to recover and, and oxidative stress will go down. So, so by changing, so, so again, diet is a window where you can have this this cascade of positive effects. So going back to Ava, so later, later that year when she, was, when she was about four and a half years old, she was started on the SCD diet. Uh, it turns out a, a, one of her mom's friends had, had knew, knew Pam and they, they met on the playground. So within three weeks, she was able to discontinue her reflux medication, which she had been taking, taking since infancy. She also was able to stop the appetite stimulant. Uh, she began to move her bowels regularly, which, which hadn't been happening. And she started combining two words when she spoke. After two months, she, she was able to speak in sentences, had better eye contact, and, and she was more social. And this is, so again, the before. This is a picture of her after. And her mom, her mom keeps a, a fairly strict diet journal. So I know you can't see that well on that side. So this is a, a journal entry from a, a single day where she was having scrambled eggs, meatloaf, green beans, zucchini meatballs, spinach, peas, and even rutabaga. Basically, her life, her life changed completely due to that. So, so if, if you take nothing away from you know, the analogies we went, we went through, if you could remember this, this quote, that we must never forget what the patient takes beyond this power of di digestion does harm. I, I think it, that, that's, a, that's a guide for using di dietary interventions. And I also want to mention this other quote 
which is from a, a, a book about chronic pain. And it's from a distance. One paradigm seems to succeed in another in the blink of history's eye. But in their era, they surrender slowly. And lives are lived and lost in the interim. And I think as, we, as, as more microbiome research is being done, there will be ways to change the microbiome other than diet. The fecal transplant has been, has been one method lately. But I think it's going to have a, a, a strong positive effect on many autoimmune diseases. I mean, they're looking at changing the microbiome for diseases across the board right now. And now I'm going to hand it over to Pam. Just, if you want to stand up for one minute, but we ask you not to leave the room, we just have to switch the mic. So thank you.